Um, so the um, the next talk is not about the virus total. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's so it's about detecting uh, emerging threats uh, before they reach virus total, before they are shared, and so on. And uh, so Andreas and uh, Anastasia have the floor. Thank you. Well, I'm not Andreas. Yeah, yeah, not Andreas. Sorry, <laughs> Yuri. Uh, Andreas, unfortunately, uh, was Thank supposed you. to talk. Uh, unfortunately, he could not come, so um, I'm um, the leader but of this you're group. You're undressed today, no? Hmm? You're undressed today? Yeah, I'm oh, okay. undressed today. Yes. No, Yuri. <laughs> Yuri and Anastasia, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, so um, we're going to talk about today uh, about the work that we've been doing for uh, probably a year um, to uh, try to develop the machinery to detect uh, emerging malware in the cloud um, at scale. Uh, using fuzzy hashing, uh, and uh, there is a, uh, a large team worked on this project, uh, and uh, uh, Anastasia uh, Polikova uh, and me, Yuri Zifovich, are going to present today. But uh, I want to uh, mention by name that uh, Gan Tan, uh, Ali Honliang uh, uh, made a very significant contribution, more than I did, uh, leading this group. Uh, and Andreas, uh, uh, so we are from uh, Alibaba Cloud. Uh, but um, Andreas uh, is from Dama Academy of Alibaba, so this is a research uh, uh, unit of Alibaba Group. Uh, and uh, so uh, in the picture, uh, we kind of like to think about uh, ourselves sometimes as minions. Uh, we live to serve. <laughs> so, um, so these are the speakers today uh, without Andreas. So with that, uh, I'll let uh, Anastasia take over. Thank you, Yuri. Thank you, Dominika, for warm reference. <laughs> so um, I'm Anastasia Polikova. I'm secu senior security engineer of Alibaba Innovation Security Lab. And today, uh, we will start with security reasons. Why did we start this research and how it goes, what we achieve. But first, first things first, why? Um, when you work in a big company and you have a lot of customers and the scale of basically everything is huge, you start to treasure little things and the little things become big. So third party validation of any IOCs you have comes with a price. First is a latency and latency from the both sides in our case. First of all, when we talk about validation of the uh, SHA value in our case, we're talking about not one SHA value we need to validate manually somehow, but we are talking about huge pipeline of the SHA values we need to validate. So we need to build the whole pipeline, put them into the queue, validate them with virus total usually because we use it, and then wait for results and interpret, uh, in interpret this result. So latency comes from the both sides, from our pipeline and from uh, third party validation, in our case, virus total. Um, of course, license are not free, so we need to pay to virus total to get an access to the data, obviously. And it's, it's not very bad, I would say, uh, as, as long as you have a budget, you can afford it, but it creates a huge dependency of your security program and your security software to one particular third-party vendor who provides you with validation. And then dependency can bite you back one day. For example, what if Virus Total decided to go out of the market on the country or work with only particular companies or revoke our license for some reason? How are we going to proceed? Should our security program stop or what are we going to do? Of course, in case of our team, we serve the cloud customers. It's not acceptable at all. We need to continue operation. Second reason is ambiguous VT result interpretation. Probably you all seen this very frustrating page when virus total just return you no results found. I have no idea what you're talking about. How we should interpret that? Is it malicious? Is it brand new? Is it benign? We don't know. So that's frustrating, but not that frustrating like very unclear result. 
For example, we all know that the virus total has around 60 different agents, engines that contribute to detection. And when you validate a show value, and only two of the 60 agents tell you, yeah, we think that's malicious, what are you going to do? Are you going to trust? How are you going to validate it if you don't have any resources to go deep inside of the malware binary and reverse engineer it? Is it malicious? Is it false positive on these two vendor side? Is it false negative to others? How we should treat it? And of course, there is some geopolitics stuff like malware targeting Chinese customers in underreported to virus total. Uh, a lot of our coworkers in um, Alibaba Cloud use completely different uh, source of TI than virus total and a lot of malware goes under the radar when we're talking about Chinese market and malware targeting Chinese customers. I know you have heard about Chinese malware a lot for the, for the previous day, and for this day probably we will hear again and again. But when it goes to analytics and to reverse engineering or some data about this malware, best you can do, find something in Mandarin that you need to translate using Google Translator. And virus total usually absolutely not aware about this malware. Uh, last but not least, cloud-specific threats. Um, you know, as any other cloud provider, Alibaba shares security responsibility with the customers. So we cannot be responsible for everything. Some binaries belong to the customer, and those binaries are part of their business and their operation. But if we can see only the share value, how can we guess? Is it a binary belongs to the customer? Is it a malware? Is it well-known binary we've already seen? Nobody knows. So considering all of this problem, we decided that we need to start our own research and we need to take our uh, validation, IOC validation, at least partly at home and not ship everything to the vendors outside because of all these problems listed about. And there is a tale of two cities. This is a virus total and our cloud. So in our cloud, we gather particular information about binaries. We gather SHA value and MD5 value. And if we have some suspicions about this particular binary, we go in and check it with virus total, like, hey, what do you think? Does it look like any malware you know? But unfortunately and sadly, too often we, re we receive the replay like, I have no idea what's that. No results found. And again, it, we start to frustrate what we should do with that, how we should classify it. So it leads us to the idea, so maybe we try to verify not the right data. We're asking for the wrong question and we receive the incorrect answer. This is how we start to gather and collect fuzzy hash. Come on. I'm sorry. <laughs> so fuzzy hash, I believe most of us know what it is. Fuzzy hash is a contextual hash that basically can uh, consist of three different blocks. First is a block size. Second is hash one and uh, divided by a uh, column, the hash two. Uh, in this example, we provide you with um, SSD fuzzy hash values for, for uh, Phoenix minor family. Uh, let's talk about distance. If you look a little bit closer to all these hash values, I believe nobody needs to be genius security researcher or data analytic to notice this eyeballing, you know, um, common parts and eyeballing, uh, eyeballing simu uh, similarity in between several hashes and some difference. So, yeah, let's show some respect. Um, this miner tries its best, and if we cannot look for the fuzzy hash as is deep in our case, and we can look only on um, MD5 or SHA value, we will never ever guess that this SHA value or MD5 value belongs to the same malware family. They are completely different. But because fuzzy hash is contextual, we can see the similarity with the bar I. 
and we can see the difference. And if my sore red eyes can see the difference in similarity, machine can see it even better, I believe. So why not to try? Um, so the one term we need to know is the distance. What is the distance? Uh, distance is a function of two, uh, of two fuzzy hash values, and it basically shows how similar they are. Usually distance lie in, um, in a range from zero to one, or from one to 100, depends on the algorithm you use, but basically as bigger the, di as bigger the distance, as less similar your shell values are. Um, okay, I believe that every second security engineer, every first security team, once came up with this idea and think, okay, fuzzy hash, it looks so great. We will concur the world if we implement that. Why nobody did in a large scale? Because the idea looks much more simpler than implementation itself. And why did we dare to try? Why did we give it a try? Why we start to work on this project? Because we have some advantages and some privileges, of course. <laughs> I'm not trying to tell that our team is any better than yours, but probably our data set is bigger. And first obstacle every security team runs it I, uh, is a question, do you have enough data? Because even I don't have enough data, and I have like very few lonely SHA values I'm gonna to compare to each other, game is over. If I cannot benchmark them, and if I, uh, if I cannot uh, measure the difference in between known malware or known benign files and my unknown hashes, how should it work? No, we need a huge database of hashes, and we need to label them. We need at least a little bit of knowledge of what is malicious, what's not. Algorithm and computing power. This obstacle can scare almost anybody away. Because when you start to think about, okay, fuzzy hash is pretty long and, to be honest, fat line. We need to find the similarity in between and we need to compare it pairwise, one by one, to the million different SHA values. How can I afford it? What algorithm should I use? And especially if you're going to rely on publicly available algorithms like, for example, Java library for fuzzy hash, probably first try and first run will scare you with a bill for cloud computing or for your own hardware, and a lot of team will give up on this project. Um, not blaming anyone, it's really expensive if you're gonna do it like that. Use cases. We all like security research, and we will do it for free. Like, let's be honest, because it's, it's fun, it's interesting, it's something we love to do. But who is gonna pay for our toys if we have no use cases? And especially for expensive project, you need to justify the budget. You need to have use cases. You need to make your research productized and applicable to something. And of course, great team. Um, I, again, I'm not telling that my team is, you know, <laughs> greater than yours, but the one advantages we have, our team is very diverse. We have everybody. We have uh, data scientists, we have engineering part, we have securities, and we have analytics. So this has led us to spread the task and work faster and build the whole pipeline uh, and productize all the research our scientists provide us. Okay, so as a cloud provider, we have all of that. We have a lot of use cases, we have a lot of problems, we see samples we have no idea about every day in enormous amount. Uh, algorithms in compu computing power, computing power is not a problem to a certain level considering that we have the whole cloud behind us. But again, we need to be modest and optimize all the algorithms. And to optimize them, what do we need? We need a good engineer, engineers, we need a good uh, we need good scientists, and we need somebody who is able to validate the result of this research. So, great team comes into the place. And if we have all four answers on the place, why not to try? Let's start with sample collection. Let's see what do we have and how big the sample size is. So, uh, 
At the bottom of the slide, you can see an example of the data we gather from customers' machines. We do it with uh, special software like XDR and logs, uh, like every other cloud vendor does. There is no, no secret. So first of all, we um, take MD5 because it's relatively short, relatively easy to take, and relatively inexpensive. Second, we take SHA value, which is already longer and more expensive. And the last one, SSD, which is, to be honest, pretty fat and pretty expensive to take, not even compare, but just to get it and gather. But anyway, we start to work and we, and we gather all of the about from the cloud security product. So our SSD library size in the cloud is 100 million and we're still counting. What do you think, 100 million samples, is it a good news or bad news? <laughs> okay, your best guess. Well, I would say that for data scientists, it's really good news. Big data, everything's supposed to be classified very tightly. We can find a lot of connectivities in the graph. Everything looks amazing. For engineering part, it looks terrifying. It looks frustrating. It looks like, uh, how are we going to do this? And how this miracle in between of engineering and science happened, Yuri will tell you right now. And I think we probably need to speed up a little bit since we are between uh, us and lunch. Uh, that would be my guess. Um, so yes, as uh, uh, Anastasia mentioned, that uh, I was able to assemble a great team uh, that uh, comprises of different um, specialties, and uh, that allowed us to execute not only the scientific portion but the engineering implementation and. Um, uh, what uh, challenge is, uh, obviously, that we were trying to solve is uh, how, uh, how to process the library. And by the way, the library, it's important to know, uh, note that uh, the 100 million um, uh, samples uh, was collected from uh, the customers who um, uh, authorized uh, the security software that actually uh, make it possible. So, And uh, what we wanted to do is to compare, essentially, uh, each of the sample to each of the sample, right, to, uh, to calculate pairwise similarity. But if you try to do it on 100 million times 100 million, uh, even the cloud provider, even the large one, uh, will not uh, be able to process it uh, uh, in any uh, limited time uh, or cost. So we did uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, tricks to reduce the space. So, uh, for example, uh, we limited the block size uh, to, let's say, half, equal, or double. Uh, we also uh, implemented a pretty uh, um, interesting uh, optimization. Our engineer uh, implemented uh, uh, the way to scan only for those that have uh, seven uh, characters uh, matching uh, as a pre-filtering. So, uh, in, in these uh, steps, uh, um, also, oh, and by the way, you also need uh, redundancy cleanup because uh, a lot of zeros and binaries, for example, uh, uh, manifest uh, uh, themselves in uh, a long character, um, uh, repeating characters. So uh, there's a, uh, it's uh, it's a uh, usual um, practice. So with all this prefiltering, we reduced it to um, manageable for us as a large cloud provider. And, but still, nevertheless, uh, we ran for several uh, days uh, the algorithm that uh, created the initial uh, space and spent probably about 50,000 uh, instance hours, uh, which uh, uh, I'm glad we had the resources uh, for it. So what, what we uh, uh, constructed is uh, basically a pairwise similarity between the 100 million uh, uh, samples and uh, what, uh, what can you do with this, right? Uh, you create a large graph. So this is a, a, a representation of the graph that is uh, just at the kind of foundational uh, storage layer. Uh, it, but uh, what the next important question, once you constructed the representation uh, of your uh, library, uh, what do you do next when new binaries appear? So that's uh, where we added a pipeline to detect uh, new SHA values, uh, uh, which is pretty uh, straightforward, uh, uh, although at scale nothing is straightforward. And we compare the, uh, the ones that we see for the first time, we compare to our graph, and we evolve this graph uh, 
in close to real time. So we are not rerunning, it's like for several days we can uh, do it uh, daily or hourly. So what, what this uh, uh, produces uh, is a very, very nice um, uh, uh, representation. So once you construct the graph, uh, obviously uh, there are a few challenges with this. Uh, in order to even construct the graph, we had to make it in parallel uh, and uh, do a lot of tricks that uh, from the graph theory uh, that Andreas actually was um, the driving force uh, for it uh, scientifically. But uh, it allowed us uh, to not only create uh, eye candy visualizations, uh, which uh, will uh, add uh, more in the paper, but also uh, uh, seeing it uh, as subgraphs uh, connecting uh, known and unknown uh, uh, malware samples. Out of 100 million uh, samples, we approximately had 1% uh, uh, labeled. Um, so mostly by our researchers at a certain uh, point of time. And uh, that uh, created uh, different opportunities uh, to, to do two different kind of analysis. So if you have this uh, graph representation, uh, you can uh, do both um, uh, lookups, essentially, or analysis with the prior information, uh, with a seed, right? So when you're uh, trying to see what your new malware or new binary is connected to, what, uh, uh, what uh, similarity it has. Uh, and when uh, you don't have a seed, what do you do? Uh, that's what we did at scale as well uh, by clustering the large graph that we had into uh, subgraphs without having any seed information. So in a way, um, uh, uh, if, you, if you have uh, a subgraph where you know one of the binaries, uh, you know that pretty much uh, the whole subgraph is probably bad. But uh, if you have a subgraph that is, uh, has high similarity, but nothing is unknown, then you're just waiting for uh, a security researcher or virus total or somebody to confirm at least one member of this graph and then you can propagate it, right? through the uh, subgraph, but you did the homework uh, and you, this subgraph is waiting to be uh, annotated, basically. Um, what, what's interesting uh, is the difference between polymorphic uh, and uh, code reuse similarities. So for uh, polymorphic, we um, uh, set um, uh, a higher threshold, so let's say 97%, uh, because it changes a lot. Uh, and, oh, another trick that we used uh, for polymorphic uh, uh, malware is uh, because it changes so much and there are so many different, uh, 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 very similar uh, SSD uh, fuzzy hashes, so we just stop uh, at 5,000 uh, uh, similar SSDs uh, and uh, we just don't uh, add them uh, anymore because uh, more, uh, like there, there's no difference of value between 5,000 or uh, 100,000 of uh, different flavors of the same thing, polymorphic. But for the code reuse, uh, uh, something like 80-ish uh, percent uh, is more appropriate uh, because it uh, doesn't have all the same components. Um, and um, uh, also we um, observed uh, that sometimes even lower percentage signifies uh, a certain uh, reuse uh, or shared library, uh, in which case, uh, 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 we didn't do it yet, but we can do uh, a component analysis and actually compare the binaries uh, rather than the SHA values. So uh, that uh, actually, uh, um, as, as being a leader of this group, uh, I just want to emphasize that uh, maybe if somebody wants to do some this project at scale, uh, what, is, what was super important is uh, to have one team where scientists and researchers and security researchers and engineers work together instead of just throwing the scientific prototype to engineering department and wait like for half a year or a year for execution. So uh, uh, you, you gotta have a very tight collaboration uh, and essentially the same team. Uh, they all need to be in the same team to produce these results at scale quickly. So now uh, I give Anastasia back to dig a little bit deeper. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's take a look at the real case scenario because, yeah, I, I will try to go fast because everybody is hungry. I will keep it nice and fast. So, 
Um, let's start with our old, well-known malware, SOAR DDoS. And probably you know that this malware is polymorphic one. What does polymorphic mean? It means that this type of malware can change its copies during the self-replication. And um, SOAR DDoS is well-known uh, as a malware for Linux machines, but in the last several years and in the last month, it started to adopt new techniques. For example, it starts to infect the uh, Windows machine as well, which has come as a surprise, to be honest, because it's not really easy to adapt something that was created for Linux to infect the Windows machine, considering the, all the layers they have inside of the separation system. And even more, it adapts the technologies to exploit vulnerable container services. So now your malware can be ran not only on your instance, but in, on all the containers of your instance in the cloud, which, it, which, give, which give it um, a great scale, to be honest, and more possible ways to make money and perform the DDoS attack like it used to be. So XORDDOS uh, has a special function, random MD5, and this function works to uh, change the hash value, the SHA value, uh, MD5 and uh, the SHA, for new samples of this malware. But it still has a well-known pattern of creating the directory it used to run. This directory usually locates in your bin or TMP, and it, uh, it has, um, 10 random letters, no numbers, um, all lowercase, uh, all the different 10, 10 letters name for the directory when it starts. A different hash value can bypass threat intelligence like virus total, and SOAR exploit this function a lot. So Alibaba Cloud has a lot of rules. We gather them over the years to investigate how does it work, uh, what features this malware has and how we can, and all the samples we can keep, we'll label it and we keep it in our database. Let's consider one example how polymorphic, uh, polymorphic um, detection invasion works. Let's um, take a look at the picture. First initial um, malware binary that was dropped at the machine has very particular uh, MD5, as you can see it on the first line. Then, during the self-replication process, this malware creates the copy and modifies this copy with um, RAND MD5 function. Basically what it does, it does part in the um, end of the file with random data, random strings, and change the directory. Also, also it loves to change the directory from user bin to bin, from user bin to TMP, and vice versa. So, in one moment, several seconds, we have completely different file with different size, different uh, MD5 hash, and absolutely different location. But we still know the algorithm, how it names the directory, and some other patterns of the behavior, because we've been observing this malware a lot. Let's take a look at the fuzzy hash on these two samples we just discussed. So MD5 looks completely different. It's like, there is, nothing, uh, there is nothing in common. But they cannot trick fuzzy hash that easily because, uh, again, fuzzy hash is context, contextual, uh, contextual value. So when we see the same samples, but from the fuzzy hash view from a deep sha, we can, we can clearly identify where this random MD5 function works and how it changed the value. And it's not significant. So if we're looking for similarity, and similarity is an opposite of distance. Distance um, shows how far away samples from each other, and similarity is an opposite. How close they are related, how much they have in common. Usually the range lies in between um, zero and one, when zero is like, this binary has nothing in common, completely different. And one, these binaries are similar, completely identical. And again, if we, take the, if we take the similarity function from two of these hash values, we can see that that's significantly high. It's very close to one. So from the, our point of view, this is the same malware. It doesn't matter that the file has the different 
size and different location and different SHA or MD5 value, this is the same. Let's take a look at the real example. This is subgraph extracted from our big graph, and this is subgraph for Oxordidas. All the blue dots are unknown binaries. We see them for the first time. We have no idea what it is. And we try to compare the new binaries with, some, uh, with something we already know. And we know about sorted dots, right? So if you look at the distance, you can see that the that similarity is pretty close to one. Even the, uh, the least one, uh, 0 0.79, is still pretty close to one than to uh, half, for example. So from data science point of view, that's enough to prove that this is malware. Guilty by association looks the same. If something walks like a duck, flies like a duck, and looks like a duck, it's probably a duck, right? But from the point of view of security engineers, how should I know, okay, that looks similar, but I need to verify, is it the same malware? Is it a malware at, at all? So unfortunately, we had a problem to share internal tool screenshot and everything because it's our because logs gathered by our internal uh, proprietary security software. But what I actually did, I went to the machines and pulled all the logs provided by these binaries running. And what we can see is that they have absolutely identical behavior to all the malicious XOR DDoS file. It's the same. I verified. I approved the algorithm. Algorithm got productized. And let's take a look at the results. What, do we get? what did we get? So, sort the DOS and virus total. The first SHA, you can see very old one and very significantly um, malicious, I would say. Almost all the virus total engines uh, consider it malicious and it reported very well. But what to do with other uh, 211,000 samples we have? That's a lot, right? So we start to try, we start to verify it, uh, with different vendors to see how much overlap do we have. We already know they are malicious. We already uh, we already validated them with our system. But what about other vendors? And apparently, that we find out very interesting thing. Avira has a very good overlap, 73 persons. That's impressive. But virus total has only one person and uh, 1.2. Uh, persons of overlap. How come? You probably know that Avira contributes to virus total result as well. But, you know, business-wise, I guess they don't contribute everything because they need to sell, to sell their own licenses. Uh, maybe that was a huge delay, but we try to verify it, not on the very fresh data as well. Nothing actually changed it. So it possible, possibly it is a delay, possibly it is a limitation of contribution of other vendors to virus total itself. But that looks a little bit frustrating. So yeah, polymorphic techniques can bypass virus total. And I think we get, uh, we get a pretty good results to labeling all of this stuff itself. But let's quickly take um, they will take a look from the different point of view. We've been talking about difference. Uh, our threat actors try to, uh, to introduce into the malware to make it look like something new. But what about similarity itself? Let's talk about code reuse. Code reuse is actually a technique that shares in between malicious software and benign software as well, because we have the same li libraries, we have the same to be honest, GitHub, when everybody is copy and paste, Stack Overflow, you name it. If code is exists, somebody is going to use it, even if it's not the best quality. I can, I, I've seen it already many times. So this is an opposite approach, what we're trying to do. We're trying to find the piece of shared code in between of different malware samples and malware families. Why? Because we want to know uh, we want to track the malware campaigns, and we want to know um, the evolution of malware families. It works absolutely the same, but in this case, we're targeting not the difference, but similarity itself. We're targeting shared code. And I have a few cute pictures from our data scientists to show you the result. And this is a graph from ransomware, for ransomware and from miners. It shows the shared code in between of uh, different samples inside of the families. 
What do you think? Why they look so different? It, because it looks like the ransomware reuse code much less, and they have very few significant families, and the miners, almost all of them look the same. How comes? Um, mostly, this is my opinion, but I believe that it has some, some you know, rational be behind, that the ransomware is pretty unique. Uh, it's relatively expensive uh, malware. It has different um, encryption keys. It has different set of exploits to get to the machine. And it has different techniques uh, of uh, getting the payment, interact, interact with the user, and um, index the whole file system. It works with different file systems that you need to index, then cipher, then encrypt. So yeah, it's not that much to reuse, to be honest. And they have several families, but Overall, it's, it doesn't look very similar. And miners, what, what I want to do as a hacker to create like, uh, like malware with a miner? I use the normal miner, absolutely legitimate software that people use for mining, and I need to weaponize it. So what I need to do, I need to create a harness that will deliver my miner to the target machine, exploit some vulnerability, right? So most of the code are still the same. It is the same miners, the same algorithms, the same protocols, just the harness for delivery and droppers are different. Everything else is the same. This is why they look pretty different. But the difference can be even greater. So this is Mirai and Engine Tesla. Mirai is uh, one of the first open source malware everybody can pick up and use. Super easy to, re uh, to reuse, super easy to add new exploits, to weaponize it. And Agent Tesla is a remote access Trojan, very highly obfuscated, very highly packed. So in this case, it's really hard to find shared code because of the obfuscation techniques. But anyway, we still managed to do this. Let's go to the finals. I know everybody is hungry. So to recap the flow, searching for the graph and you, searching the graph for new binaries is much faster than any third party validation because we have everything at home. We know exactly what we are looking for. We optimize all the data. We optimize all the algorithms for search. We know exactly this is our, uh, our, our tool and we know how to use it. In home validation approach, remove uncertainty of VT result interpretation because we label everything, we know where it belongs, we have all the samples here, we can take a look, we can reverse them if they want. Virus Total does not provide this information. And present workflow implemented in security products in Alibaba, and we're still working on expand of you know expansion to expand our contribution to this product. One question, is SSD essential? Basically, no. Any other fuzzy hash you can afford will do. For example, LZJD is bigger one. It takes a lot of space on your, on your disk, but it's much more accurate, I would say, and it, and it can track, like, swap the data and fragmentation and everything. So it's not critical to use exactly SSD. Everything that listed here suits you need. Whatever you can adapt, whatever you can support, whatever you have cap capabilities of, please take a look and try to build it. Okay, K takeaways from everything. So successful malware evolves and comes back and again and again. Um, nobody knew that we're gonna be talking about Mirai and Sordidos after seven, eight years after the first release, but they're still here. It's super easy malware to adopt. It's super easy to change, super inexpensive to use. And you don't even need to fire your super expensive zero day. And they works just fine. Just modify it, sell it, and go. So we cannot get rid of this in, in, in the near future, I believe. Big companies face specific malware threats, and we have unique security needs. So it's easy to overgrow even best third party validation. So far, we find out that the label propagation and clustering are two major techniques in SSD graph framework. If it does sound a little bit intimidating, no worries. It's absolutely standard algorithms to work with the big data. Label propagation allows us to provide the attribution to the family, and clustering just allows us to gather naturally 
um, data without labeling to the, uh, to the clusters we're going to investigate. And besides the, everything we listed, the potential use can be even detect the supply chain pollution. And if you don't know what supply chain pollution is, probably everybody seen this SSHD malicious server that looks exactly like SSHD, but it has a Trojan side. So this is exactly uh, po po pollution of the supply chain. When you install something benign and you believe that this is a part of the system, but it's already got screwed somewhere. It's pretty much it. It's the last word I want to, still want to tell to Virus Total. Guys, we still love you, for sure. We still love you, we're still with you. You contribute to community, great, but for us, it's time to go. It's time to grow, and we are here for that. Thank you very much. Just, just one last uh, uh, note that I would like uh, we're, to say. We're five minutes late already. Okay. Uh, thank uh, <laughs> for the invitation and Alibaba for making this trip possible. So, and the paper will be published, the upcoming conference paper. Thank you.